Hello everybody, I'd like to talk to you today about one of the questions that came up during our work on uh, preservation of fruits and vegetables. And the observation was made that we're used to seeing some sorts of fruits and vegetables preserved in particular ways. For example, there's tomato sauce, but there isn't mushroom sauce. And we're used to strawberry jam, but we're not used to, say, tomato jam. And is this true because it is technically impossible to make jam out of tomatoes or to pickle tomatoes? Uh, or is this true simply because people don't happen to like it? Or it's uh, not popular for selling? And so uh, I thought we'd examine today what the different kinds of food preservation are and some typical examples of how they're preserved and consider why things that aren't preserved that way aren't preserved that way. So we have a method uh, and we have an example and then we have an example of a thing that uh, most of us in the US anyway are not used to seeing preserved that way. So first up is a nice uh, standard method called canning and in canning we put our fruit or vegetable uh, in a can and we uh, surround it with a fluid with a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt. We seal it so nothing can get in, and then we heat it to a very high temperature to kill everything that might uh, grow inside. And we do that for peas. Maybe uh, you haven't seen it done for chicken. Similar is making a jam or a jelly. And when you make a jam or a jelly, you add lots and lots of sugar. Uh, and you heat it up and reduce the water activity, both through driving off water and having added all that sugar, and then you also seal it in a sterile container. Don't do that for tomato so much. Fermentation and its allied process, pickling, take fermentable sugars that are in the food and uh, allow microbes to turn them into uh, preservative-like products that taste good and are not generally harmful for us. So that's how you make pickles. You can hop straight to adding acid and just make quick pickles, uh, but we tend not to make, say, citrus that way. Salting and drying with or without smoking is a classical method of preserving meats and fishes. So this is something people do with uh, pork. So you can imagine a ham uh, has been treated this way, but you might not see it so often for fruits or vegetables. And then the final method that we are gonna consider here is uh, making a sauce, which is a lot like the, the jam and jelly as mentioned earlier. We make tomato sauces, uh, but we don't tend to make mushroom sauces. And again, making a sauce is reducing water activity by adding materials and by boiling off some water and then keeping it in a sterile clean container. Notice I've left off the uh, ultra clean processing in one, because those are things we can't uh, do at home, uh, two, because, well, uh, that works for just about everything. Um, but uh, why do we do some of these and uh, not others for different sorts of foods? Let's explore that a little bit more. Okay, let's exorm, examine some of these reasons, exorm, uh, that we may or may not use different methods at different uh, kinds of foods. So there's two classes of reasons we might not do this. One, Technically, it might not be possible. Somehow making jam of tomatoes just doesn't work due to some of the properties of the tomato. Uh, another reason might be that it is social or cultural. Uh, while it's possible to make jam out of tomato, it's just not something people in a particular society or a particular time in that society happen to like. And how can we examine uh, which of these is true. There's something in the middle, actually, which is it's possible, but the quality isn't as high as some other uh, methods that we have access to. Uh, and that is something that can definitely change with time and place as different technologies uh, are spread throughout a culture and society. So let's look at some examples and see of these things on this table, are they mostly because of A, it's just technically not possible, or B, because it's not what we prefer anymore, and B's sort of subset, which is the results aren't as good as some of our other choices. Let's start with reason B first, and we're gonna do that with the help of my 
uh, older cookbook collection. This cookbook, the American Woman's Cookbook, is a general purpose cookbook originally published in the 1920s. This version is uh, from the early 1940s. And it's the kind of cookbook that purports to have everything that a person uh, who is taking care of a household would need to know how to cook. Now, I think this kind of cookbook is a lot of fun because it gives us a lens into what our uh, Americans were cooking uh, in the early 1940s, as is demonstrated in this screenshot, gives us a bit of an idea how tastes change with time. Um, aspic jelly, not so popular anymore. Braised tongue with aspic jelly, probably something I dare say most of us have never eaten. So what does this cookbook have to show us about food preservation? Well, you can see that on this page that's devoted to butters, which is something between kind of a jam and an applesauce, we have something that's available still to this very day, apple butter. But we have some things that seem uh, a little bit more unusual, such as, whoops, the grape butter uh, or even tomato butter. And here I'm setting us up for a pattern that you're going to see over and over again, where uh, the foods of the 1920s are not exactly the foods of the 2020s. For example, on this page devoted to jam, we see some common jams that you could buy at the store right now, strawberry or marmalade, but we also see uh, a tomato jam, a green tomato jam, but still a tomato jam, and something I'd never really seen before I looked at this, which was a carrot and orange marmalade. And what does this tell us? It tells us that many of the foods we preserve uh, are being done in a particular way due to the way uh, tastes of people and cultures have evolved over time. Um, and less about it being exactly how it's done. Um, but let's do a few more examples and uh, dive into that a bit. Nice to know that if we had a time machine to 100 years ago, people still would be making pickles. However, as you probably now expect, we can see that pickles aren't the only things people were pickling. For example, we could pickle some mangoes, we could pickle some currants, we could pickle plums, and heck, we could even pickle peaches. Um, this is pretty interesting because there's a, quite a lot of sugar in that, but still there's a lot of vinegar. And I wanted to be sure to share one of my favorite pages out of this cookbook where we see that ketchup, you know how the uh, Heinz tomato bottle says tomato ketchup on the bottle? And you maybe have wondered why the heck do they need to tell us it's tomato ketchup? It's the only kind of ketchup there is. Well, no. Ketchup is, in fact, derived um, from a Asian recipe that goes uh, a long way back and originally was much more focused on mushrooms. And it was adapted and imported and changed many, many times until uh, when it got to be popular in the United States, it was really mostly about tomatoes. But you can see, even as recently as the 1940s, Folks may have been making their ketchup out of grapes or mushrooms. I want to pull in one example from another cookbook. This cookbook from the early 1950s is aimed specifically at desserts and fruits, as you can see from the cover. And you may recall from uh, other videos in this class or uh, biology classes you may have had in addition, that many of the things we eat as vegetables, such as zucchini or tomatoes, are actually fruits. And some of these we see reflected in this cookbook. So let's take a look at what people in the United States were being told by this cookbook to do with avocados. This entry makes it clear that the authors of this cookbook thought that most of the readers of the cookbook would be unfamiliar with avocados. They don't have an explanation like this for apples, for example. And while if you walked around Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and asked people to propose an avocado dish for you, um, you might run into somebody who's making guacamole, you might run into somebody who is uh, having avocado toast from Amami for breakfast, uh, you would be probably unlikely to find someone who said, 
oh yes, my main use of avocados is to uh, mix it up with cream cheese and crushed pineapple and eat it as a dessert. Um, this is not me calling this wrong, it's just calling out uh, differences in fashion that as recently as, well, 70 years ago, uh, a mainstream cookbook was telling people the thing that you really do with avocados is treat them as fruits, because they are fruits, and make dessert out of them. Uh, whereas uh, right now, the mainstream information about avocados tends towards savory and appetizer sorts of dishes. Taking this all together, I think there's a, a lesson I want you to get. This is a selection of cookbooks that just shows a slice of a particular part of American culture that happens to be captured in cookbooks in a particular uh, decade, say from mid 1940s to mid 1950s in the United States. But you can gauge what's captured here against, for example, your experience on campus and what foods are available uh, to get a small idea of how much change with time there could be. And this is not even considering change with geography and culture. You can have uh, foods right now that are quite popular uh, all over the world. Uh, we had, I had a student in my food class last year where his home culture uses avocados as a dessert and a smoothie mix base primarily, and not as uh, something that you might have with dinner. Um, and you can have citrus that is pickled. That is a part of a number of Mediterranean cuisines. And there, while there are some technical barriers, it's primarily a cultural basis. Let's go talk about the few technical barriers there are on the next slide, and then we'll sum up. So let's wrap up by summarizing our technical considerations. One, is it in fact possible to conserve fruits and vegetables by different means than their conventionally understood means? Could you make jam out of a cucumber? And the answer is almost certainly yes, you can. Almost every process works for almost every uh, type of food as long as you prepare things uh, properly. This goes pretty well, however, with item B, which is, well, how's the quality? And the answer is that can be highly variable. Things like canning and uh, putting stuff in jars and salting things has an impact on flavor, on texture, and on nutrition. And quite often, that's a negative impact. And so it, it changes people's preference for uh, what they can get. Would you always want a pickle when you could have a French, fresh cucumber? Finally, is there an impact of society, culture, fashion, and trends? You betcha. I think just by looking at that small slice of cookbooks from just one country, um, you can see that things change pretty rapidly, and things also change pretty rapidly, or not pretty rapidly, pretty uh, significantly as you move across cultures. And in fact, if you reflect, even available in Lewisburg are some uh, things that are preserved in ways that uh, we don't always expect. You can buy canned meat, you can buy pickled fruit, you can even buy jam that is made out of a more savory vegetable. So uh, a key influence on these trends, however, is uh, quality. That is, shipping has gotten a lot faster. The ability to freeze things and refrigerate things over long distance travel has also gotten a lot better. So if we consider cookbooks from the 40s and 50s to today, um, just about uh, everyone would prefer a fresh pea, for example, or one that has been flash frozen to uh, one that has been canned. And so some of the influence of different processes being used nowadays than uh, in the past is one of uh, availability more so than um, fashion trend. I don't really expect canned peas to ever be 
more popular unless other uh, varieties of peas become too hard to get.